Hey everyone out there, Steve here. As you know, we are members of the Parthenon Podcast Network. Our podcaster-in-chief is Scott Rank of the History Unplugged podcast. I am sure most of you are aware of Scott and History Unplugged. Scott has been a multiple-time guest on all of my podcasts. In History Unplugged, Scott presents history from a variety of perspectives, genres, and eras. Today, I'm going to share with you an episode Scott produced on a group of Southern cavalry who fought for the North during the U.S. Civil War, so a little surprising take there. I really think you'll enjoy it. If you want to learn more about History Unplugged, how to subscribe, and more, head over to ParthenonPodcast.com or look in the show notes. Talk to you soon. Scott here with another episode of the History Unplugged podcast. After the Civil War ended 160 years ago, Southern historians crafted a narrative that the North only won the Civil War due to the overwhelming material and manpower advantage over brave Southerners. For decades, revisionist historians have pushed back, arguing that the Civil War was won when courageous Yankees triumphed over the South. But one aspect of the war that has remained little known since its end is a number of Southern Unionists who played a decisive role in the Civil War. One such group was the 1st Alabama Cavalry, formed in 1862. They mostly consisted of Jacksonian Southerners who lived in Appalachia and didn't feel a strong kinship to Southern plantation culture. The 1st Alabama Cavalry went on raids that destroyed Confederate communications and also marched with Sherman's forces across the South. They aided in the fall of Vicksburg and the burning of Atlanta. Today's guest is Howell Raines, author of Silent Cavalry, how Union soldiers from Alabama helped Sherman burn Atlanta and then got written out of history. He pieced together the fact that Union General William Tecumseh Sherman's decisive effort to burn Atlanta was facilitated by a regiment of over 2,000 Yaleman farmers and former slaves from Alabama, including at least one member of Rain's own family. We look into why some of the best-known Civil War historians, including Shelby Foote, gave only passing or no attention to this regiment of Southerners who chose to fight for the North, a regiment that Sherman hailed as one of the finest in the Union, how they were excised from the historical record, and finally, we look at how unified Southern support of the Confederacy really was. Was Union support in the South only among isolated pockets, or was there a widespread, well, not silent majority, but silent plurality that was never fully behind secession? This is a deep dive into how history gets made and overlook people from the past, and I hope you enjoy this discussion with Howell Reigns. And one more thing before we get started with this episode, a quick break for a word from our sponsors. Let's start off with an aspect of the story that coincides with your family history. Your story hinges around when the Civil War began in 1861 and the state of Alabama's unionists, including your own great-great-grandfather, went into North Alabama's hill country to avoid Confederate conscription. Can you tell me about what you knew of this story growing up based on family lore and what ultimately led you to write this book? My first hint that our family was not part of the pro-Confederate majority in the Deep South came from my grandmother, who was born six years after the end of the war. And one day, when I was about five or six, she told me a story about her and her husband walking down the road near their, the dirt road near their farm in Walker County, Alabama, up in the hill country, seeing a neighbor approach. And my grandfather, for whom I'm named, said, oh, here comes one of those damn Democrats. That was my first hint that we were not part of the Democratic solid South, but part of a minority that I later found out to be Republicans. That scrap stuck in my memory. And then in 1961, when I was a freshman at Birmingham Southern College, I found a a book called Stars Fell on Alabama that was a bestseller in 1934, And it's since become hard to find in Alabama because it dealt with racial issues. And it had a capsule version of the story of Winston County, Alabama, my mother's home county, which is called the Free State of Winston because it tried to secede from Alabama in 1860 when Alabama was getting ready to secede from the Union. In that book, I found reference to, quote, a man called Sheets who led the anti-war movement in the mountains. 
And that name stuck with me. And that led to about six decades of connect the dots historical detective work on my part. What we're going to look at here is a disappearing of a story from archival records and the forensic work that comes into discovering it and, first of all, proving that something was disappeared. But before we get into all the historiography, let's first look at the history so we can get the full picture. Can you tell me about the 1st Alabama Cavalry, what it was, its formation, and who the people were who joined it? Yes, they were mainly residents of the 22 northernmost counties in Alabama, which are in the mountains of Alabama. Because they're in the mountains, there were no large plantations, and therefore very few people owned slaves. Their small farms simply wouldn't support the income needed to buy slaves. In addition to the fact that they were economically different from the plantation south, of the Black Belt in the region below Montgomery in South Alabama was that politically they were shaped by the Andrew Jackson tradition. They were Jacksonian Democrats, and they believed in Andrew Jackson's 1840 dictum that the Union must be preserved. He said that to John Calhoun when that South Carolina senator was trying to divide the Union for the first time. And the Jacksonian Democrats simply believed that the union that had been formed in the Revolution and the War of 1812 was too precious a thing to be done away with over the issue of slavery. Most of the mountain folks were not abolitionists. They simply felt that there were ways to keep the union intact without going to war over to preserve slavery. I'd like to explore this a bit more because... For all the new scholarship in history that is reexamining the Civil War and challenging the lost cause myth, many people will display the South as a monolith, that everyone supported the institution of slavery, even though they recognize that percentage wise, few people owned slaves because it was very much an upper class activity. There's a depiction of the South that everyone supported the idea of it and this neo-feudalism and one of the last dying lights of a royalist British society that's descended from the Virginia Cavalier royalists that then spread out west. But it sounds like the different migration patterns into the South, such as the Scotch-Irish that made up Appalachia and were the bedrock of support for Andrew Jackson, have a very different cultural tradition and that there's a multiplicity of different voices. But this is me speculating. Can you tell me about what made up these different viewpoints in the South and what would make someone a unionist in the South? You're exactly on the right set of demographics and settlement patterns. The best lands in the Deep South, Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi, were bought up by the wealthy plantation owners from Virginia and the Carolinas who had originally populated the Atlantic seaboard. At the same time that they were buying up these rich, flat cotton lands across the Gulf Coast South, a great migration among the Scotch-Irish immigrants who flooded into Philadelphia in the prior to the Revolution had begun a migration down the spine of the Appalachians from Maryland and Pennsylvania all the way down to the southernmost Appalachian foothills in northern Alabama. Now, the upshot of this was all along the Appalachian Highlands, these Scotch-Irish formed an independent culture that had little to do with the aristocratic culture of the plantation owners who lived along the coastal plains. So you had two distinct Souths. The South of the plantation owners was, of course, wealthier and had better access to education And they were able to get their story into the historical narrative in a way that the Highland dwellers from West Virginia all the way to the northeastern corner of Mississippi were not. They simply didn't have access to the educational and journalistic institutions. So they existed in a kind of cocoon, unbeknownst to most Americans. And their numbers were much larger than had ever been really focused on. As you say, only about 5% of Southern families owned 
slaves. So the 90 plus percent didn't have an economic investment in slavery. When the war came, these Appalachian Highlanders were much more resistant to the war than has been popularly supposed. The monolithic support for the war never existed except for a flash of regional outrage after the attack on Fort Sumter in April of 1861. Otherwise, a likely majority in the Highlands opposed secession, and you can prove this by looking at the often neglected political makeup of the conventions that voted for secession. In Alabama, the ordinance of secession passed only by a fairly narrow majority. There were 39 out of 100 votes in that convention against seceding. Indeed, in the first test vote in that 100-member convention, 45 delegates out of 100 voted against going out of the Union and into the Confederacy. So that means politically, even in gerrymandered legislatures that the plantation owners controlled, the Unionist faction was close to half, even in a rigged system. So that is the most accurate measure of the level of Southern resistance to secession. It was not a monolithic popular movement. It was an oligarchical movement controlled by the ruling wealthy people who control the frontier politics of the southern states. When we think about one's loyalty to a state rather than a nation pre-Civil War, people understand that in terms of, let's say, Robert E. Lee fighting for the Confederacy, even though he was personally against slavery because he was a proud son of Virginia. So we understand that aspect of loyalty to state. But this brings in a whole other dimension that one is an Alabaman who is of Scotch-Irish background, who doesn't see himself as part of a Southern melting pot and his cause is the same as a Virginian or a North Carolinian. This cuts in a whole different direction of loyalty to one state, that his priorities would be different from someone else in another part of the South that has a whole different culture and a whole different background because he's an Alabaman or a Northern Alabaman, not from some other part of the South. So I think this is alone starting to introduce a whole lot of different ideas about how we understand the antebellum era. Looking at the Alabama cavalry, now records are sparse. So a lot of your book details what we don't know about them as much as what we do know about them. But let's start off with what we do know about them. Can you tell me about their formation and initially their raids to destroy Confederate communication? Yes, you had in, as we just discussed, in these northernmost counties of Alabama, a Unionist majority. And on Christmas Eve of 1860, in the delegate election, a 21 year old school teacher named Chris Sheets burst from obscurity and defeated a plantation owner by five to one vote to become Winston County's representative at secession convention in Montgomery that convened in early January of 1861. Sheets was threatened with hanging along with 23 other delegates who refused to sign the ordinance of secession. This was their way of protesting their counties being forced to join a nation they didn't support. And they were militarily suppressed, and Sheets himself was quickly imprisoned by the Confederate authorities as an anti-war activist. He was, in fact, although virtually unknown, probably the most effective anti-war organizer in the Deep South. He was what today we would call a community organizer. In the periods when he was free from from imprisonment, he worked the back roads of North Alabama to encourage local farm boys, for the most part, to sneak north to the town of Huntsville, Alabama, which the Union occupied in April of 1861. This is very early in the war. And so you had this movement of these Alabama yeoman farmers, for the most part 18 to 30 years old, let's say, following old Indian trails and dirt roads by night to reach Huntsville, Alabama and volunteer for the Union Army. 
So this was a political protest that has been virtually completely ignored by pro-Confederate historians and because it's missing from the Southern record by national historians in their widescreen histories of the war. This was a war within the war that went virtually unreported. In the spring of 1862, so many of these volunteers who were coming through the forest at night to enlist showed up in Huntsville that General Don Carlos Buell, the Union commander there, got permission from the Lincoln's War Department to organize them into a Union regiment. So you had this early in the war, the second year of the war, a special regiment that eventually came to number 2,066 Alabamians, along with volunteers from neighboring Appalachian areas, formed into the 1st Alabama Cavalry USA. And there was a Union regiment from every Confederate state except South Carolina, but Only in 1992 did we understand how large this contingent of Union volunteers from the South was. Richard Nelson Current, a famous Harvard historian and Lincoln biographer, did the arithmetic and found out that 100,000 Alabamians who were residing in the 11 Confederate states in 1861 served in the Union Army voluntarily. This is in addition to the thousands of freed slaves who also served in what was called the U.S. Colored Troops. But these white Alabamians and Southerners made up almost 5% of the Union Army. This was a stunning figure to American historians when Current discovered it and published it in 1992 in a book called Lincoln's Loyalist. But it's taken the now almost 40 years or since that time for a new generation of doctoral students to start digging into this buried history, as it were. And although my curiosity about this story began, as I said, around 1961, it was not until these students completed their dissertations that I was able to collect all this information and tell the complete story of the 1st Alabama Union Cavalry. How would you characterize Southern Unionists, people who are imagining this are probably thinking by way of analogy. Maybe they imagine the French resistance during World War II, uh, scattered cells of different groups of people communicating clandestinely to high command that's located outside of their terrain, could be much more or- better organized than that. How would you characterize it? It has some of the makings of a classic resistance movement. I would characterize it also as having been merged into the regular United States Army in a much more organized way than we've ever supposed. And the 1st Alabama Cavalry illustrates that story uh, line exactly. In 1862, the Union also occupied Corinth, Mississippi. And so these Alabama refugees from Huntsville and the northern part of Alabama were invited to go to Corinth, Mississippi, and there they came under the influence of one of Lincoln's favorite political generals, Grenville M. Dodge. And he and his adjutant, a colonel from New York named George E. Spencer, recognized the natural ability of these zealous volunteers, and they organized them into a fighting and spying unit that caught General Sherman's attention and caught Grant's attention as they were preparing to start the Atlanta campaign. It's one of the ironies of this buried history that this unit was well known to the Lincoln's high command and probably to Lincoln himself. They were written up in the New York and Cincinnati newspapers, including the New York Times and the New York and the powerfully influential New York Tribune. And yet they got washed out of Alabama history through a process that I've reconstructed as kind of the detective story part of my book. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a short break for a word from our sponsors. I think what's most interesting about their actions is their involvement in marching with Sherman and their contribution to the fall of Atlanta, Vicksburg, and moments that 
in Civil War history, the Southern South depict as the most loathsome, despicable parts of the war, which the Alabama Cavalry were directly involved in. What was their contribution? And can you walk me through the end of the war and their involvement? While they were based in Mississippi and being trained as soldiers by Dodge and Spencer, they became part of a very important movement leading up to the capture of Vicksburg. Vicksburg fell in July of 1862 at about the same time, at almost exactly the same time, that the Union prevailed in the Battle of Gettysburg. Gettysburg overshadowed Vicksburg, but Vicksburg was terribly important. And the first Alabama learned their fighting and spying skills by fencing off Nathan Bedford Forest from attacking Grant's forces in Vicksburg. So they played an important role in that curtain-raising event. Then came their main entry into the stage of the Civil War narrative. As after Vicksburg fell, and because the Union was controlling the Tennessee River across North Alabama, Grant and Sherman convinced Lincoln that they could end the war by going to Chattanooga via Alabama and then taking a southern turn and marching on Atlanta and on to Savannah, thereby breaking the spire of the Confederacy and ending the war. This was the master strategy that Lincoln had been searching for, and he had fired numerous generals who would not aggressively pursue this kind of plan. So he basically commissioned Sherman and Grant to end the war with Sherman marching on Atlanta and Savannah while Grant pinned down Robert E. Lee's army in Virginia and in front of Richmond. So that was the master plan. Now, how did the 1st Alabama Cavalry fit into this? First, Grant had, General Dodge had organized for Grant the most important spy network in the Deep South. Again, not much known. But he used at least 20 members of the 1st Alabama Cavalry to dress as civilians and be part of a network of hundreds of spies that stretched from New Orleans all the way to Richmond. And this force, Grant's secret intelligence force, became a tremendous advantage for the Union. Now, at the same time that the 1st Alabama Cavalry was producing some volunteers for this great spy service, they were becoming really effective fighters, and they caught Sherman's eye. And Sherman was very close to Grenville Dodge, the commander of the 1st Alabama, the commander of a much larger force that included the 1st Alabama. And Sherman decided to use these Alabamians as his personal escort for the march to the sea. So at this point, the Union Army has captured Chattanooga, and they're massing for the march to Atlanta from Chattanooga following the railroad south. And here is Sherman who says, okay, I want one company of these Alabamians to live with me, make my camps each night, carry my cigars and my whiskey, and the rest of them will be part of my advanced cavalry that will lead the marchers from Chattanooga to Atlanta. And this is the part of the first Alabama story that pro-Confederate historians in the Deep South tried to erase from history, in effect. And so then we get into the story of the march to Atlanta, the burning of Atlanta, and the march from Atlanta to Savannah, all of which events, the first Alabama was sort of the point of the spear of Sherman's invading army. We're going to go from history to historiography now that we're getting to the end of the war. And before we get to how people's memory of Southern Unionists was erased and a perception that everyone supported the South. At the time of the Civil War, how much were Southerners aware of dissidents, Southern Unionists? Was the existence of groups like the First Alabama Cavalry widely known to people in the South during the Civil War? It was. What some historians have called an inner war going on in the Mountain South with often guerrilla activity between partisans of both the Union and the Confederacy, while the main publicity in the newspapers and so forth went to the big battles that whose names are famous to us in history, Gettysburg and so forth. 
But this ferocious guerrilla war was raging throughout this time, and Southerners were very well aware of it. In addition, after the Battle of Shiloh, the first big Union defeat in 1862, middle-class support among white Southerners, particularly those who did not own slaves, melted away. The Confederacy not only did lack popular support among non-wealthy Southerners, but Lee's army from 1862 on to Appomattox was constantly afflicted by desertions. As early as 1863, Union officials, or rather Confederate officials, estimated that there were 10,000 deserters and draft resistors hiding out in the mountains of North Alabama alone. And that was a Southwide pattern, particularly important in the Appalachian states, Georgia, Tennessee, North Carolina, and of course, that part of Virginia that became West Virginia. Now, let's look at how this story is forgotten with the first generation of Civil War historians. The creation of the Lost Cause myth typically begins with Jubal Early. Could you tell me about him and then others that follow in his wake, Archibald Dunning and others that you think are influential in this early period? Yeah, there are two stages to this part of the story. One is playing out in Alabama, where angry pro-Confederate historians and archivists were trying to defame the first Alabama. They knew about them and they hated them. The other theater of the story shift to Virginia. General Jubal Early, one of the great characters of the war, Lee called him my bad old man. He was the only Confederate general to reach the outskirts of Washington, D.C. during the war. After the war, he became obsessed with the idea of salvaging Robert E. Lee's reputation. In the eyes of the Union, Robert E. Lee was a traitor, and he was in danger of hanging, as was Jefferson Davis and others. Lee, however, was able to escape prosecution. He became president of the what was in Washington University, now Washington Lee, near Jubal Early's hometown. And Early devoted himself in the 10 years after the war to organizing a group of Confederate generals into memorial service associations, praising Lee's courage and holding him up as a patriot on the same level as Jefferson and Washington. At the same time, groups known as the LEAs, Ladies Memorial Associations, were lionizing Lee, erecting statues to them, memorializing his burial place, and so forth. Early was a very cunning politician, so he organized all of these energies into what came to be known as the Lost Cause Movement. This was taking place between 1870 and 1890. The scene, in terms of Lost Cause development, shifts north, oddly enough, to New Jersey, where the young son of a wealthy manufacturer, the son's name was William Archibald Dunning, is imbued by his father with respect for the plantation owners. His father, a businessman, viewed the Southern plantation masters as businessmen like himself who were unfairly treated in Reconstruction. So he imbued his son, William Archibald Dunning, with the idea of respect for the Southern slave owners as a misunderstood aristocratic component of American society. Dunning goes on to Princeton and then to Columbia. He gets his Ph.D. at Columbia, and starting in 1900, he becomes the preeminent Civil War historian in the United States. So now you've got this lost cause toehold in the Ivy League. That is a very, you know, a surprising element of American history and little known. But starting in 1900 until his death in around 1920, Dunning dispatched scores his Ph.D. students trained in pro-Confederate sympathies to set up the history departments at the major universities in the South, including Vanderbilt and the University of South at Sewanee, and notably at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. So what was the impact on American historiography as a whole 
of this cadre of well-educated pro-Confederate scholars becoming in charge of major university history departments. This is easily traceable, but it's a very important part of the story. As they become rooted at the University of Virginia, the University of North Carolina, University of Alabama, University of Florida, University of Mississippi, and so on, they start writing the Civil War histories of those individual states. That's an important step because when the second and third generation of Civil War historians in the years before the Civil Rights Movement in 1960 start to write comprehensive histories of the war, they have to rely on these pro-Confederate state histories. In the case of Dunning's student Walter L. Fleming, his Civil War and Reconstruction in Alabama, published in 1905, remains amazingly a tremendously influential work. And he depicted the 1st Alabama Cavalry as renegades and criminals who were not worthy of being studied for their Civil War exploits. So that, long story short, is how the 1st Alabama Cavalry got disappeared from mainstream historiography. It was because of the Dunning School's affection for the Southern plantation class. Now, an adjunct of that, in my research in the Alabama archives, I found correspondence between William Archibald Dunning of Columbia and Thomas McAdory Owen, who founded the Alabama archives in 1901. He became a prominent national figure and worked with Dunning in giving the American Historical Association a pro-Southern tilt. In 1903, Dunning led a delegation of Ivy League politicians on a chartered train to Montgomery, and Thomas McAdory Owen gave them an acclaimed midnight nighttime tour of the lighted monuments to the Confederacy in Montgomery. So this powerful alliance of Dunning and Mac Thomas McAdory Owen became a part of the American history establishment, as it were. And this is where the Alabama nest comes into sharp focus. Owen and his wife, who succeeded him as director upon his death in 1920, they decided that the Alabama archives would collect only the stories of Confederate soldiers from Alabama, and they decided not to collect the stories of the estimated 3,000 Union soldiers from Alabama. So that's how they were literally erased from Alabama history. And my mission as a historical detective became trying to piece together the story that the Lost Cause historians, led by Dunning and the Owens couple, managed to bury the story of the 1st Alabama Cavalry. That's an important point about how history gets written. We point to historians, which are, of course, important on how we understand history, but perhaps equally important are the archivists who get to decide what is and isn't seen. And for my background as an Ottoman historian, if you're a Westerner who wants to write about what happened to Armenians in the empire in 1915, you're going to get some cold stare at the archival from the archival staff. However, if they know you to be firmly in the Turkish nationalist camp who will carefully vet and filter the sources that you have to produce a pre-written narrative, then they'll work with you much more closely. That's just one example. And here, I'd love to unpack and see what you found from your research, because seeing what was disappeared or not released or not collected is challenging, and it can rely on chance mentions in letters or diaries. Can you tell me what you found from seeing from Thomas and Marie Owen, how they tried to silence the first Alabama cavalry, what was disappeared, and what perhaps was there originally? Scott here. One more break for a word from our sponsors. Yes, that Ottoman uh, comparison is very apt for how uh, Confederate history got written. You know, it's an axiom among modern historians that history is not what happened, it's what gets written down. In Alabama's case and the Confederacy's case, because of Dunning and his group, the losers got to write the main narrative of the war. Ken Burns, the filmmaker of the great documentary, The Civil War, says he thinks 
that the Civil War is most unusual in that the losers got to write the history. Your Ottoman parallel is enlightening to me because it seems like the same process. Now, D. Brown, who wrote Bury My Heart at Union Knee, was a trained librarian, and he said, the librarians know the secrets, not the historians. He's meaning that these surviving records that may be buried or ignored in the archives or ignored in the narrative histories are where you have to go to find the true story. And that's what I did in my work at the Alabama Archives and in the parallel scholarly enterprise I did to go to scores, perhaps hundreds, of scattered references in history books and diaries to the 1st Alabama Cavalry. So I had to put together this mosaic-like history from myriad sources about their military record and reclaim that record, but I also had to figure out how Thomas McAdory Owen and his wife, Marie Bankhead Owen, who ran the Alabama archives from 1900 to 1955, were able to bury the story of these Alabamians. And what I found out was, pursuant to D. Brown's observation, when the librarians and the archivists are corrupt, as they were in Alabama, the true story can get buried and is very hard to resurrect. In the course of my research using my grandson, Jasper Raines, a history student at the University of South Alabama, as my assistant, we found in the Alabama archives the original federal rosters, handwritten rosters of the first Alabama companies mustered in at Corinth, Mississippi. This was not listed in the holdings of the Alabama archives, and indeed, Steve Murray, the current director, didn't know that they were among his holdings, and he's been very cooperative in updating the Alabama archives. But this, what this shows us is that for over a hundred years, Alabama's archives not only possessed the records of these Union soldiers, but they hid them. In reconstructing how this happened, I've come to view Thomas McAdory Owen as the prime suspect. I think he did it on purpose. Steve Murray and I believe that he was probably given the these original rosters while he was working as a postal office clerk in Washington, D.C. as a young man and became friendly with the director of the National Archives. So we think he simply was given these documents and brought them back to Alabama and purposely mislabeled them to hide them from historians. In any event, that explains the process of disappearance that operates in erasing people from history. What happened to these sources, as far as you know? Were they mislabeled, unlabeled, locked away in a room, destroyed? And what sort of sources were these, based on what you know? Well, they're marvelous historical documents. They're written in almost a calligraphy-like hand. And so the way that my grandson Jasper and I discovered them is that the clerks at the archives there, when he requested first Alabama cavalry records, they brought him this set of muslin-wrapped ledgers written in 1862 and 1863 and told him, we know you're interested in the Union, but these are Confederate records. They had been mislabeled as records of the first Alabama Confederate cavalry and best as we can tell, held in the records of the Alabama Confederate Adjutant General's Office for at least 100 years, perhaps longer. So that's the story of those particular records. The parallel story is that the Owens were part of a lost cause establishment that included the History Department of the University of Alabama and the University of the Alabama Press. And that group became a sort of cottage industry of publishing lost cause and pro-Confederate histories. So this was a kind of a multi-layered interment, as it were, of the story of the first Alabama. This interment was so successful that national historians wanting to write about the Civil War could find none of this original source material in Alabama because it had been suppressed. That's why when you read Shelby Foote's 
great narrative history of the Civil War, his three-volume history, you will see no mention of the 1st Alabama Cavalry and almost no mention of pro-Union population in the South. Foote was a Confederate nostalgist. Although he tried to write an even-handed history of the war, he became the primary source for Ken Burns in filming his 1990 documentary about the Civil War. I was able to show in digging back into Foote's history that he knew about the 1st Alabama Cavalry and purposely avoided telling Ken Burns and his two co-authors about this part of the Civil War story. Again, this is a chain reaction in historiography where if something is disappeared in the early stages, well-intended later narrators like Ken Burns can't find out what really happened. And Ken and Rick Burns and Jeffrey Ward, the three authors of that screenplay for the documentary, have all been very cooperative with me. They were all stunned when I brought the 1st Alabama Cavalry to their attention. They had never heard of it because Shelby Foote had never told them about it. And as I say, I was able by finding a rare interview of Foote that was published before he died in which he admitted that he knew that the Alabama Unionists existed and had fought in an important Civil War battle. So this is, in some sense, gaps in history are an accident. In others, they're a conspiracy. But long story short, most Americans don't know about Southern Unionism or the 1st Alabama Cavalry because of this cluster of historians who, by accident or design, left them out of history. Do you speak to the motivations of why this story was repressed, especially from the mid 20th century onward? It's one thing for Jubal Early to do it because he has a vested interest in portraying the Confederacy as positively as possible. But it's almost like today, both sides, people who like the idea of the Confederacy in history and those who oppose it, don't want to acknowledge Southern Unionism, that for those who deeply despise, in a sense, anything Southern and anything having to do with the South would want to portray the South as negatively as possible. And then Southerners who dislike people who they think are trying to impugn their heritage and cast them as demons will look to their heroes and as an act of defiance, want to support Robert E. Lee and get tired of being told how terrible they are. And there's a strange convergence where it seems both sides are squeezing out Southern Unionists. So I'm portraying one side, but there's probably much more to this. So can you talk about the motivations of trying to repress this story? Yes, there in the original part, Thomas McAdory Owen and his wife Marie, who were zealous members of the Sons of the Confederacy and Daughters of the Confederacy, did it because they didn't want to acknowledge that Alabama contained citizens who didn't support the lost cause, who did not support the Confederacy. And they were particularly concerned because that group of Alabama could be demonstrated to have represented at least half of white population. So that goes to that original motivation. Now, as we look at the historical fallout, Professor Carolyn Janey, the head of the Civil War Institute at the University of Virginia, has written persuasively that Donald Trump seized on the lost cause narrative and the sensitivity of white Southerners to any criticism of the Confederacy as part of his political strategy, as part of his kind of campaign of historical disinformation, something that is still playing out. So since the end of the Civil War and Reconstruction, the debate over who was right and who was wrong in the Civil War and in Reconstruction has flared back and forth. And in the 1960s, with the rise of the Civil Rights Movement, we started to get a number of histories that tried to tell the truth about slavery. But we also saw the rise of politicians like George Wallace, who carefully played on Alabamians' sense of inferiority, their feeling that the nation looks down on them. And then for me, as a Southerner who was in favor of the Civil Rights Revolution and came of age as it was changing the South, I spent much of my life thinking all of this disagreement and discord was behind us. 
But now when I visit Alabama, and what's interesting about Alabama is, again, the working class whites of Alabama get along very well in an integrated environment. It is the upper class of Alabama, wealthy whites today, who are passionate red staters, and they are the reason that Donald Trump will probably win 80% of the vote in Alabama if he runs in the next election. This gets to the heart of what was going on during the Civil War and how much Southern support there was for the Confederacy. For those who opposed it, for Southern Unionists, how widespread were they in society? In any war, there's always opposition to a cause, but it can vary widely. On one extreme, let's say, those who protested the United States' involvement in World War II after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, there were groups, but more or less they were marginal and such a small factor in society that they were easily marginalized by the very large and overwhelming widespread public support for the war effort, contrasted to, say, something with a very large resistance movement, like Muammar Gaddafi's Libya or Saddam Hussein's Iraq or Soviet Poland's with the Solidarity Movement. There's a wide wellspring of resistance, and all it takes is cohesion or a strong man to lose his grip just slightly, and the thing comes tumbling down. So those are two extremes. Broadly speaking, where would you place the Union support in the South during the Civil War? The Union support in the South during the war followed a very classical pattern. It was a matter of dispute up until the attack on Fort Sumter. That caused a peak in Southern nationalism saying, we don't want to be invaded. And that was the period of the most monolithic support of the South. Then as the Confederacy started losing the war, it continually lost white support. That said, I don't want to min- man- you know, overstate the minority opinion, unionist opinion in the South. It was, in political terms, a minority. It had hot spots of strength in northern Alabama, eastern Tennessee, and North Carolina. Those were the hotbeds of unionist sentiment. But it was overwhelmed after the war because during Reconstruction, a new alliance of oligarchs, that is to say, the people who owned the land in the Confederacy, the vast agricultural and timberlands before the war, wound up owning it after the war. And then northern investors coming south to invest in the textile and and steel industries formed an alliance with the traditional landowners, creating a powerful southern bloc that controls most southern legislatures to this day. And then Alabama has almost absolute control. So the white Southerners in Alabama know their heritage. It's because they were deprived of it through a collection of political power and legislative power that influenced what was taught at the state universities and what leaks into the modern narrative of life in the South. So I don't, you know, I'm not naive that if you did a man on the street person on the street, I should say, interview in Alabama today that most white Southerners would register as pro-Confederate. The irony is that tens of thousands of them don't know they have ancestors buried under Union grave markers in the cemeteries of Alabama and in the National Military Cemeteries like those at Chattanooga. All right. Well, this is a really interesting exploration of the Civil War and how the views were not monolithic, not even on one side. And I think it challenges a lot of what we understand about it. So there's a lot more to dive into here. And for listeners who want to explore the story much further, the name of Howell's book is Silent Cavalry, How Union Soldiers from Alabama Helped Sherman Burn Atlanta and Then Got Written Out of History. Howell, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Scott. All right, that is all for today's episode. If you'd like to see show notes for this and all my other episodes and include sources, maps, or other relevant information, go to ParthenonPodcast.com. Parthenon is the name of the podcast network that History Unplugged is a part of, 
along with other great history shows like James Early's Key Battles of American History, Steve Guerra's Beyond the Big Screen and History of the Papacy, and other shows as well. If you'd like to support History Unplugged, there are two easy ways to do so. The first is to subscribe to the show on the podcast player of your choice and leave a review. This really helps the show grow. The second thing is to join our membership program on Patreon. And if you do so, you can get completely ad-free episodes of the entire back catalog of the show, which is 600 episodes and growing. Just go to patreon.com slash unplugged. Thanks for listening and see you next time.